Apple, ya. Uh, okay, uh, desirable drug should be a chemical that is good and in combination with other chemicals will reduce the symptoms of the disease and without causing very severe side effects, okay? Uh, Okay, so uh, what are some of these uh, data we talk about uh, that, can, that are, we can use to enhance uh, drug discovery? So we, in this slide, I think it's very congested, but I can assure you um, all the diseases that we have uh, on the globe uh, interact or have an interface in one of these uh, domains of data, okay? For example, uh, high throughput data that is used in bioinformatics and that is linked to drug discovery, for example, you will find that when we talk of genomic, we, you hear of uh, SARS-CoV-2 having mutations, point mutations and creating resistance. Uh, now not being, uh, sensitive to some of these vaccines. So when we talk of genomic data, we're looking for mutations, gene duplication, genome rearrangement, um, and gene regulation networks. We also have what we call whole exome sequencing. Exome means uh, the whole expression, all the uh, RNA transcripts that are found in an organism. When you do the sequencing of uh, the transcriptome, we call that whole exome sequencing. And then we have what we call transcriptomic data. You look at just how a, a particular gene is regulated. In some diseases, uh, there's a defect in uh, a gene that is coding for a particular normal function. And therefore, if there's a defect, you will find that there is a, a disease will come in. There's usually some could be in form of somatic mutation, others could be a transcription start sites or termination sites. You find that some genes are completely absent in some individuals and some of them are overexpressed. There's an excess copy of that and that becomes an abnormality also, okay? We have uh, things such as ribosome profiling, uh, proteomics, you find that there's differential proteome abundance, uh, post-translational modification, and signal pep peptide and cellular localization. And when it comes to also uh, protein and RNA structure, this is where uh, most drug uh, discovery projects make use of this data. And we look at the binding and docking properties, uh, location of child residues, electrostatic interactions. We look at enzyme substrate and ligand protein interactions. And when we get to another uh, domain of data called C systromic uh, uh, data set, we get genome-wise binding sites of proteins and also transcription factors. And when we look at the genome architecture, how do you know that this is a novel, uh, I'll use SARS-CoV-2 because it's a big thing nowadays. You will find that, how do you know that this is a different lineage? You look at genome architecture. You, look, you compare what is known to what you've just discovered. If it's different and significantly different, you say you have a new, a new isolate or a new lineage or a new subspecies uh, for that matter, okay? And also we have another domain called epigenetics. This is the interaction of the, uh, the impact the environment has on your gene. And this include things such as DNA methylation and histone modification. So with all these data sets, they at one point have a role to play or interface with a drug discovery uh, pipeline. And uh, I'll just highlight some of the examples in my next slides on how some of these processes uh, get used to it. So um, just an overview of what we call computer-aided drug design. Yeah, so a receptor 
is a protein where the drug will attach. And a small molecule, which you have synthesized yourself uh, from the lab, a pharmacist or a medicinal chemistry expert comes up with a formula and he tries to find that this can bind uh, well to the site of wow. interest, okay? And so um, that small molecule, we'll call it the ligand. So those in biochemistry class will understand what uh, a ligand should be. It may be a protein or just a chemical, just a chemical in nature and not a protein, but it's made in a such a way that it has a high affinity to bind on a particular site, okay? So if you have uh, a known protein structure, uh, you will, in the known ligand, you will uh, pursue a path called structure-based drug design, okay? And there you will do what we call protein ligand docking. Okay, if you have not known uh, ligand, then you will try several molecules at uh, your disposal. And what you'll be trying to do there is called de novo design. You are starting from scratch because you're not, uh, you're not uh, starting from a molecule that you know, okay? And you have a known protein structure, <laughs> yes, uh, but you have a known ligand, you'll be doing what we call ligand-based drug design, and you will have one or more ligands, and you will do what we call similarity searching. This is just uh, actually an alignment. Uh, for those who've done basics of bioinformatics, you know what an alignment is. Alignment is comparing two sequences to the other, okay? You will do what we call some pharmacophore searching, and also uh, that involves a lot of ligands, like 20 uh, and more. And then you'll proceed to what we call quantitative structure activity relationship. So in this case, where you have a known protein structure and you have no known ligand, then it means that your computer aided drug design will be of no use because you need to, first of all, do an experiment in the lab and you, if you see some leads or some binding, then you can now modify and bring it to the computer. Okay, so those are the two, two approaches or two scenarios in which you will approach uh, computer-aided drug design. Okay, so I'll just give an example of something we call docking. Docking, uh, before I even go further, is just a, a computational process or experiment in silico experiment in which you will try to find out, uh, to assess or to gauge the binding affinity of, um, of uh, a protein and a ligand or your desired molecule and your supposed uh, a receptor where it's supposed to bind, okay? So docking is a method that predicts the preferred orientation of one molecule to another uh, molecule when they are bound together to form what we call a stable complex. So this concept of docking is very important in the sense that this is how it, you do not want a drug. Uh, there's a, in pharmacology, there's something called biokinetics and uh, uh, pharmacodynamics of a drug. So, uh, and there's also a term called bioavailability. <laughs> so a drug that is easily um, uh, depleted in blood has a low bioavailability. You want the drug to stay in blood for long so that it causes the desired effect. So if it is depleted so easily, it means its binding affinity is very low. And therefore the patient will need more doses or frequent doses. Yeah, but if it stays in the bloodstream or the site of interaction for long, then that's a good property. You don't need more doses. For example, uh, there is a reason why you told take this drug every after three hours. And yeah, so based on these uh, preliminary studies, the binding affinity, it has to bind for long for the desired time, not too long and not too short. Yeah. Okay, so docking studies, uh, they are the preliminary uh, analysis that inform those things that will go even into the 
dosage. Okay. So it predicts the docking predicts the preferred orientation of one molecule to another when they are bound together to form a stable complex. So to perform docking, one just uh, one may require protein molecule and the protein structures and ligands, and then the inputs of uh, for the docking. Okay, so it, it's just uh, illustrated in the form of uh, lock and key. So of those three shapes, you will find that the triangle will lock better there. So if you're designing, if I perform docking, there's a probability that uh, when I evaluate the binding affinity using a, a quantity called RMSD, which uh, perhaps I'll not go into it, but it's used to measure how uh, the interaction of the ligand and the protein has happened, you'll find that the, the triangle one will bind more firmly or uh, the binding affinity of the triangle will be much higher than those of the other shapes from this illustration, okay? So uh, what we do in uh, protein ligand docking, you have a protein and you identify a binding site, okay? And you have a, a ligand. You will find that uh, um, you use a protein structure. And if you use a protein structure, the computational method uh, mimics the binding of a ligand to a protein. You will see it virtually on the computer. You will be able to visualize where uh, those uh, active sites and your ligand are joining together. You will be able to see that um, uh, computationally fast before you even go and perform this in the wet lab uh, experiments, okay? So given the proteins and you have a, a binding site, in a ligand, you simulate, uh, the word is simulate, you will you'll, uh, visualize, you will try to bring together the protein and the uh, ligand and see how they interact. If the interaction is not so good, you go back again and modify and modify it so that the binding fits uh, exactly and for, and we measure this using uh, a, some parameters, which maybe I'll not go into now. So the pose of the molecule in the binding site is predicted, and then the binding affinity or a score representing the strength of the binding. So uh, what is a pose versus a, a binding site? A binding site should be the active site in the receptor. In this case, if you're talking of uh, a molecule, you'll find that the binding site is the active site, the part of the protein where the ligand binds, and generally a cavity on the protein surface and can be identified by looking at the crystal structure of the protein with a known uh, inhibitor. Okay, and the, the, the pose is the binding mode. How is it uh, interacting? How is it fitting the geometry of the ligand in the binding site? So the geometry will tell you the location, the orientation, and the confirmation. Okay, so the so also what you should note is that protein ligand docking is not about identifying the binding site is assessing how how they are how the ligand and the protein are binding you already know, you already know the binding site okay so it's not about finding or identifying where it's binding you know that on a particular uh, um, branch of your protein, that's where the binding site will happen. Okay. Yeah. So uh, let me illustrate some uses of docking. And the main uses of protein ligand docking, are, for example, in virtual screening, before these drugs are uh, made or synthesized or discovered, before you arrive at your final molecule, uh, there's something called virtual screening. And virtual screening helps to uh, narrow down to the most promising uh, drug molecules before you go and try them in animals, before you even go and try them in uh, 
a small clinical trial on a few thousand people and before you reach uh, phase three. So virtual screening is very helpful in the sense that it helps you uh, not waste a lot of time in the drug discovery pipeline, okay? So it also helps in uh, what we call false prediction. And in that case, uh, if we know exactly where and how a non ligand binds, then we can see which parts are important for binding. We can suggest changes to improve the affinity and also avoid changes that will clash with the protein, okay? So um, in virtual screening, uh, it's the computational or silico analog of biological screening. So, and this helps, as I told you previously, you will want to, uh, wet lab experiments are very expensive, okay? So you you want to narrow down, you want to narrow down uh, very, very, very uh, promising molecules. So you don't want to waste your time going, buying reagents, going to the wet lab to try out this molecule, yet it has not shown the very, it's not viable, okay? So virtual screening helps in this case, and it will save you a lot of time and also the cost of your uh, drug uh, discovery pipeline. So the aim of virtual screening, you will have to do what we call, it will enable you to score and rank and filter a set of chemical structures using one or more of um, computational procedures. And docking is usually just one way of doing this here, okay? Um, so uh, the virtual screening can be used to help decide which compounds to screen, okay, uh, experimentally, and which libraries to synthesize. Also, it can help you to know which compounds to purchase from an external company and to analyze the results in an experiment, such as high throughput sequencing run. It will give you like the molecules you have to go and sequence on the receptor. Okay. Uh, is there any question? Any any question as we go along? I'm not uh, reading the chat. Any question up to that stage? Hello, Doc. Uh, I'm requesting that uh, we, let's just progress. Uh, maybe we can have a question and answer session after this. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Sure. So uh, we have a number of components of docking software, and um, typically, uh, protein like and docking software consists of two main components which work together. There is what we call such algorithm. This generates a large number of forces uh, of a molecule in the binding site. Okay. And two, there is usually what we call a scoring function, which calculates a score or binding affinity for a particular poles. Okay. And um, so to give, a, to give a, a, the pulse of a molecule in the binding site, and also a binding affinity or a score representing the strength of binding. So in this case, once you know the pose is like the conformation or the arrangement or the orientation of your molecule of interest, and the score is the evaluation, the evaluation of the binding, how, how, how and it's measured in, um, in uh, what we call the pose is measured in uh, units called angstroms. Angstrom, okay? That's the angles at which the ligand is interfacing with the uh, protein. Okay, and the score is a good number uh, of metrics that are used. So, uh, what are some of the uh, docking software that we know of? Uh, we have a large number of them, and some of them are called Autodoc. Uh, there's one called Doc. There's one called uh, Ehit, Flex, Spread, Glide, and so many of them. And uh, I think most of them are what we call open source, open source uh, software. In bioinformatics, we like things that are uh, free, 
only few uh, proprietary um, uh, softwares are available and in use, but uh, some of the most of bioinformatics software are usually open source uh, because they are for academic and research purposes. Okay, sure. So protein like ligand docking is not to be confused with protein protein docking because that's different. When you talk of protein protein docking, then it means it's uh, uh, one protein to another. But ligand could be a, a protein, biological molecule, or not a biological molecule. It's like a, a just a chemical, a chemical compound. Yeah. So uh, maybe I'll not take you through all this, but this is just uh, the workflow or the procedure. One needs, first of all, to prepare the protein structure. There's something called, there's a database, uh, well curated, called uh, um, uh, protein uh, data bank, okay? So from there, you, you convert your protein structure into a format that a computer understands, okay? So you will find that uh, in class. protein data bank, you, you can download, you can retrieve uh, the sequence, uh, the 3D structure, and there are softwares also to visualize to visualize these uh, um, structures. Uh, one of them is Pymol, okay? Very commonly used or open source uh, um, software that can be used to visualize some of these structures. So, um, so when you're doing docking, uh, you are advised to remove all the water molecules and if you remove all the water molecules, they are uh, they make the binding sites or the side chains available for binding with your with your um, with your with your ligand. Okay. So so if there's an incorrect assignment of protonation states in the active site, it will give very poor results in the sense that there will be um, a, low, a low binding affinity. There will be a low binding affinity and therefore you will not be able to get very good results, okay? And uh, on the structures shown here, you will find that um, um, most of them, okay, uh, most of them have what we call uh, a carboxylic group end, yeah, which will uh, act as a proton donor and all that. So in a nutshell, this, um, <laughs> the binding and the docking works on the very fundamental principles of organic chemistry, whereby you find that there's an active uh, group on a particular site and it's open, it's either a proton donor or a proton acceptor. And it's about, uh, in a nutshell, bonding. If you uh, recall your chemistry, that is the same scenario that is happening here, okay? So uh, if you prepare the protein structure uh, for a particular side chain, uh, the PDD structure will be incorrect. Sometimes, uh, the structures are uh, visualized in what in, through a procedure called crystallography, which will give you electron density, uh, but not the molecular structure. So some of them usually are poorly resolved crystal structures, and therefore they pose a challenge. You cannot uh, try to, uh, you cannot use them directly for docking. You need to modify them. There are some procedures that you have to perform on, on those molecules, maybe add some uh, hydrogen molecules or remove the water molecules. And then before you proceed with your docking uh, procedure or molecular dynamics simulation, okay? So some of the, some of the um, uh, amino acids that are, uh, impacted with this kind of uh, crystallography is paragen, glutamine, and histidine, okay? So, um, so 
why is it important? It affects uh, the hydrogen bonding patterns, okay? So when you want to, if you're having problems with your, uh, the structure of your protein, then you, you have to look at the hydrogen bonding pattern in crystal structures uh, containing the ligand, okay? So once you've prepared your protein, you have to prepare your molecule. And most of these molecules, okay, uh, you draw them. You draw them in softwares such as uh, a pharmaceutical or a medicinal chemistry uh, scientist who go to a software such as ChemDraw, okay, and he will draw a molecule here and there, add some things, and it's usually just in a chemical form. So for you to use it in joking or in trying to understand the protein ligand binding, okay, you will need to convert those uh, drawings, those chemical formulas you've drawn on your <laughs> software, you convert them into PDV structure, protein data bank format, okay? And there are softwares to do that, okay? Uh, one of them, uh, just forgotten, but they are available if they are online. So if you just put in your chemical formula, your molecule that you've synthesized, it will convert it to PDP structure so that you can use it to perform a docking study. Yeah. Okay, uh, no point to specifics of this, but I'll move ahead, okay. So uh, some pairwise interactions may occur uh, very seldomly in the protein data bank, and therefore the resulting distribution may be very inaccurate, okay? And it doesn't take into account directionality of interactions, e.g. the hydrogen uh, bonds. It only gives you, uh, or it infers the interaction of the ligand and the uh, protein uh, based on pairwise distances, okay? Yeah. So uh, when we get a resulting score that contains contribution from a large number of pairwise interactions, it becomes very difficult to identify the problems and to improve, okay? So, and it's also sensitive to definition of a reference state. A drug score has a different reference uh, state to the, uh, what we call ASP. Uh, a steric statistical potential, yeah, yeah. So given a set of active sites with non-crystal poses, can one, can they be docked accurately? So that's the question, okay. So accuracy, accuracy in this case is measured uh, by a quantity that I talked about previously called RMSD, root mean square deviation. And it compares, uh, it compares this to non-crystal structures, okay? Uh, if you <laughs> go into literature, you will understand better what our MSD is, but that's just the evaluation of how the difference between two structures or the distance between the, the two structures, the protein and the ligand. The, the less the distance, the higher the affinity of binding. So you will want to get um, a very small distance, okay, uh, of interaction between your ligand and your protein, okay? So, then the best docking software predicts correct codes to about 70% of time. And all these, all these, uh, uh, all these docking software, they are simulations. They are not like uh, accuracy. Accuracy improves with addition of more molecules. They are probabilistic. They are not uh, uh, a magic bullet that you found a particular binding to your, uh, between your ligand and your protein. So you must do it several times, several times, yeah. Okay, sure. So it's always easier to find the correct pose without docking uh, back into active on crystal structure. Yeah. So I'll give you another another uh, uh, overview of what we call molecular simulation dynamics, which is uh, um, 
a way in which uh, simulations that permit the study of complex dynamic processes that occur in biological systems. And uh, this will give you molecular simulation or dynamic simulations gives you protein stability, it gives you conformational changes, it gives you protein folding, molecular recognition, uh, <laughs> A lack of proteins and DNA membranes and complexes and ion transport in biological systems and provide the means to carry out uh, uh, studies okay, of drug design and maybe determining the structure using X-ray and uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, uh, popularly abbreviated as uh, NMR. Okay. So, uh, molecular dynamics workflow, uh, you have initial input data, which is your ligand and uh, your protein, and then you assess the interaction so with what you call force field. And you will understand with this, you get the coordinates in which the two molecules are uh, interacting and the velocities, and then you compute the potentials uh, and the forces on the atoms. And then you update the coordinates and velocities according to equations of the motion. And then you collect statistics. Where This is where now uh, RMSD values are taken in the third step, okay? And write the energy or the coordinates to trajectory files. And then you can perform more steps if um, the results are not looking so good you have to repeat this for a million of steps there's a, a, a simulation called a markov chain monte carlo simulation and so these things the computer does it it's not you who's doing the calculation so don't worry but it does it like almost a million times before it settles on values that show stability of the complex formed between the protein and the light. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this is just an example of how I will visualize a protein. Okay. This is one of the uh, proteins that uh, I, uh, a collaborator sent to me to try and see if it binds to, um, it's called a CDK4 molecule. It's uh, implicated uh, in. Um, it's used in uh, cancer, melanoma, okay, skin cancer, okay. So this is one of the molecules that drugs target. So I was told to make sure I try to get the molecule that the researcher has uh, found out or has formulated in the lab and tested maybe on the wet lab and sees that it kills uh, cancerous cells, melanoma cells more effectively. And therefore, computationally, my work is to make sure that molecule, I try to visualize it, to dock it, or to perform a molecular dynamic simulation and see how it binds to this other than a free drug. So the goal of the research here is to see how one can improve the uh, activity of the anti-cancer drugs, okay? By attaching a particular molecule to known drugs, does it uh, perform better than the free drug? So, the, so this is a research that uh, um, is geared towards uh, improving drug delivery to these cancerous cells. So that's the job we're doing. I'll now give you the formula of the uh, chemical uh, for uh, intellectual property purposes, but I'm just giving you in uh, pi mole, this is what I see in pi mole. This is the protein and this structure, how it is formulated. Okay, so uh, that's a CDK4 molecule, how I visualize in pi mole. And now the molecule itself, he has called it MC1, MC2. It looks like this when I look at, uh, when I convert it, it's just a CH, CH in some uh, side chain somewhere. But when I put it in primal, this is how I, I see it, okay? So uh, the final thoughts about this is that um, protein ligand docking is an essential tool for computational drug design. And can, it's widely actually used in pharmaceutical companies. And if you read those papers here, um, there are many success stories looking at uh, uh, 
making use of protein ligand docking to be able to lead to a uh, very uh, essential drug, okay? But uh, it's not the, an all, it's not a breakthrough for using uh, docking in the sense that it's not one that will work immediately. Yeah, there's, there's, no, um, there's no perfect scoring function, okay, to evaluate the binding, okay? And the performance also varies from target to target and uh, the scoring function uh, also varies from function to function, okay? Yeah. And, uh, so uh, when trying to do this kind of analysis for research, uh, care needs to be taken uh, when preparing both the protein and the lichens because some of them uh, could be misleading. And the drug discovery pipeline takes no Sure. Okay. So the more information you have and use, the better your chances. For example, you must have a variety of molecules in different forms or functions where we get a targeted library, uh, docking constraints, filtering forces, CV, and comparing with non crystal all things. So I want to acknowledge all the institutions uh, that have been through all my career. And also, uh, I give credit to Dr. Noel at uh, University of uh, College Cook, uh, who, who is the initial author of uh, a workshop I attended for these uh, docking uh, slides you've just seen. And uh, yeah, I welcome uh, questions. Thank you so much, Doc, for the wonderful uh, elaborate presentation I've given on how the computer says, particularly bioinformatics is used in the process of drug research and discovery. Thank you so much. Uh, now uh, it's uh, time for questions. And maybe I'd like to start with the, from the first question uh, from Timothy. Yeah. Uh, he is asking, how will you credit targeted docking versus blind docking in that the former is biased already, his thoughts, compared to the latter? Yeah, his thoughts is that uh, blind docking yeah. is biased over the targeted docking. How will you credit that? Yes, uh, in this case, uh, blind docking it happens in instances where you maybe you do not know the structure, okay? But before you uh, you start any uh, synthesizing any molecule of a drug discovery, you at least understand the receptors where it binds and the molecule on how it's supposed to bind. So I think uh, it starts with your biological knowledge of the receptors or the molecule of interest, um, the active site that you are targeting. If you know the molecule very well, and you know its, uh, uh, its sequence, for example, uh, from bioinformatics, we start from a sequence, then we go to the uh, 2D structure, and then we go to 3D structure. If you know it very well, like the palm of your hand, I think uh, it could provide you with a uh, a very focused guide to your docking studies, yeah. And with the targeted, I think um, in this case, perhaps the structure is well characterized, okay? The protein structure is well characterized and is known and is even available like universal, yeah. So with that, you have something that is already known and therefore you train your ligand towards, yeah the uh, active binding site. I hope I've, uh, I've uh, tried to explain uh, the two scenarios. Uh, thank you so much, Doc. Yeah, I hope the, the answers are well answered. Oh, another question from Edwin Washira asking, yeah. what opportunities are there for a graduate pharmacist to yeah. hone their expertise in drug discovery? They seek to take up a role in drug design. Yeah. So in this case, uh, one needs to uh, focus his studies in uh, 
you have to have a, a very keen interest in medicinal chemistry or biological chemistry. Okay. I know uh, our pharmacy uh, classes uh, teach people to be very clinical, but you have to go out of or your way to get into science and understand a lot of scientific principles, okay, of medicinal chemistry. So from that, you should couple that with uh, your bioinformatics. Uh, once you learn bioinformatics, and there's a subject called structural biology. If you understand structural biology and you have a pharmacy background, you'll be good to go for, yeah, you will do well. You will appreciate uh, the learning curve will not be so steep for you when you want to enter into computational uh, drug uh, aided discovery, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Because maybe, yeah, maybe uh, we do face challenges in finding the, maybe the best ways to specialize in our careers. Yes. And uh, that's a, this is the highest time we will require your knowledge and professional and your assistance in guiding us. Yeah, sure. and sure. maybe on deciding the right path to take, maybe to fulfill yeah. our dreams. Thank you so much. Yeah, so structural yeah, yeah. biology, yeah, structural biology will be very good area for you to, get well versed in and then couple that with a, a, a little bit of bioinformatics. You don't need to be a computer scientist to learn bioinformatics. I have a biology background myself, but with the time you will get to appreciate. If you stay with Romans, you will become a Roman. <laughs> yeah, you acquire some skills, yeah, of Romans, yeah, sure. Okay, yeah, true, thank you so much. Another question. Uh, uh, from Timothy again, what advantage does molecular dynamics stimulations have over docking using more than one engine to prove product reproducibility of results? It is apparently expensive to carry out. Yeah. Yeah. So molecular dynamics is robust in the sense that uh, maybe docking is just uh, um, uh, Docking is one way in which uh, it's just one approach, okay? But molecular dynamics, you will have a variety of molecules, okay? To try to play around with. You can have several, okay? And also molecular dynamics is, um, has several stages, several stages is uh, that would, uh, if you follow them correctly, it will end up it will end up you getting like the best and the robust results. It has um, uh, a better comparative scale than uh, docking itself, yeah. So I, I may say that uh, uh, docking is part of molecular uh, dynamics at a lower scale, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. I hope the answers explain well. Uh, another question uh, it is asking, that is from Hilary Mambo. How do in drug design, they overcome the calculation of the binding constant as most of the existing scoring function gives some, how the how they inaccurate KD? And uh, thanking you for the presentation. Okay, so, um... Now, evaluations of your, the results of your docking or molecular dynamic simulations, uh, it's, never, it's never a single, a single shot or a single run, okay? You have to compare uh, data sets over a wide, a wide span of analysis, okay? As I just said, something called uh, <laughs> The simulation that uses um, a concept called uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation, it simulates, it tests several points or it tests several instances, yeah, or at your analysis. And by the time it arrives at a stable, stable point, okay, it will have uh, tested over a million, over a million of them. So the more you test, the more accurate the results become. 
So inaccuracies, but now there's a cost to that. It's very computationally expensive. For example, this type of work is done on what we call high performance computing clusters, okay? They take hours, they can take even weeks to do the simulation. So it's not a day's work, uh, like a, maybe a small statistical analysis where you just press a command and you get the graphs or the result. It is, it's, um, when we say in silico experiment, it means uh, it is something, uh, you, the computer is like a, a culture, culture hood. So you put in your models, your data, and it will take long to simulate and analyze, okay? So in case of inaccuracies, one is uh, encouraged to repeat more and more again until you arrive at a well-supported uh, result, okay? Sure. Thank you much. Thank you so much, Doc. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe... Uh, I think if we don't have a more question, I'd like to ask a, a question uh, concerning, yeah, you've said that uh, uh, you are ligand of interest, after analyzing your ligand of interest, you might find that uh, it doesn't fit well to the active site of the or of your target protein. Yes. Now, uh, how will you modify your ligand, maybe to obtain a good pose in your target protein? Thank you. Yes. Over to you Doc. Yeah, either. Uh, some of the tricks people do, okay, you can remove a particular side chain or add a hydrogen or add uh, uh, a certain molecule, okay, and try again and see if, but now the side chain you add or the hydrogen molecule you add should not have, um, should not change significantly the backbone, the backbone of your ligand. Yeah, so that's the strategy. Either you modify it or you change parameters, okay? You deal with the structure itself, either add some hydrogen bond or add, uh, uh, um, add uh, uh, remove a side chain, okay? Or you change the parameters, for example. Uh, the, uh, when you inputting uh, this, um, uh, this data into the analysis, there are specific parameters that are, uh, are uh, required. So perhaps you try a different model, okay? Or you try different parameters and see if there's an improvement or it gets you more worse, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, a, a second question uh, I might ask, uh, maybe yeah, due to development of technology and uh, yeah, let's say the artificial intelligence, Yes. We have observed uh, there's a lot of changes that have been accrued in the pharmaceutical industry and also, yeah, and uh, let's say in research. Yes. Now, uh, my question is, how do you think, what do you think will be the effects of uh, the development of technology or artificial intelligence in the field of, uh, field of science? Maybe the positive and the negative effects. Thank you so much. Yeah, so... Uh... I'll start with the positives because there are many, okay? So uh, computers here, <laughs> they don't do what they have not been told by a human being, okay? They just make work easier, okay? So uh, with the advancements of technology, you will be able to carry out experiments that you could just dream of in the past, okay? So new algorithms or new methods new techniques that have come up have enabled now more uh, hard questions to be tackled, okay? So uh, technology, and it will advance, it will not stop at where we are now, uh, more uh, complex and easier things will come up. And that is a positive sign that, uh, especially when it comes to bioinformatics, for example, right now, yeah, the, I worked with a group in South Africa, whereby when you just give a HIV sequence, okay, and they pass through the algorithm, it will give you a, a chart whether this uh, patient, okay, is resistant to this antiretroviral or is intermediate or is sensitive, okay? Just that from a sequence. 
you don't need to go and um, do more experiments in the lab or what or what. Yeah, you look at that. So such, 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 the, the, the algorithms are designed, for example, to know the coding sequence, okay? From the sequence we just submitted, it, it, it's uh, designed to uh, extract biological meaning, yeah? On the sequence that you just submitted. It knows where the stop codon is, it knows where a particular gene is, and therefore it's too easy. When a clinician looks at a chart of colors, green, red, and yellow, uh, green for sensitive, red for resistant, and yellow for intermediate, he is able to make clinical decisions quickly here. Yeah. So based on that, you can see how technology uh, is and is going to be very good. And let's look at uh, drug delivery. Drug delivery, for example, is helping people to identify how the existing drugs maybe can be repurposed and be used in a much more better uh, way by modifying them, maybe adding a, a appending a molecule on it so that it uh, attaches to the receptors much more firmly than before, okay? And also, uh, AMR, for example, there's uh, AI methods you, that are applied when you just submit uh, your sequences from uh, your bacteria, the E. coli may be isolated in Kibera, for example, yeah, you just submit that sequence to that algorithm and it will tell you that uh, this one is a resistant trait to this particular drug because there's a mutation here, 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 and there, okay? And this one shows signs of developing resistance. So it can be predicted so that in the future it can uh, be able to uh, modify the uh, drugs or uh, you know that an isolate or a strain of a particular disease that is circulating in this region is resistant to a drug. And therefore maybe change the course of drugs or do this or do that, okay? That's uh, one other way technology would uh, definitely, yeah. And uh, of course, um, currently you've heard of uh, this precision medicine whereby each individual, not everybody responds uh, because of their genetic makeup, not everybody responds to medicine like any other person. So like uh, here in Michigan, uh, I was very surprised to find that every child that is born is tested for gen is tested genetically for uh, the purposes of predicting if the child will develop any genetic disease. You can imagine all newborns, all newborns are tested for sickle cell, they are tested for maybe Down syndrome, they are tested every newborn within one week, they take a, a drive plus spot, okay, from the child and test is so that they can advise the parents, okay, in future, how they can handle this medical, uh, medical uh, uh, situation when it arises. So I can tell you that technology will improve things. Now, the downside of technology is that it requires lots of resources and know-how, okay? You cannot just wake up today and you claim that you want to test each newborn child yeah, for a particular condition, okay? You cannot implement it in a resource limited settings. That's the big deal with technology. All these cloud uh, platforms you hear, of, it's because of the money, the resources, yeah. The resources that can support that. So it's just that technology becomes expensive sometimes, okay? I think that's my take on uh, how things are going, sure. Oh, thank you so much, Doc, for the uh, very well explained uh, answers. Thank you so much. Maybe I could just ask one last question. <laughs> I'm sorry for asking a lot of the questions. No, because, no problem. Uh, <laughs> no problem. Have some time. Yeah. Uh, okay, okay, thank you. Maybe, yeah. Uh, as you can see, the artificial intelligence or uh, yeah, computer aided drug research and design, uh, it is one of the current trends in drug research discovery and innovations. And maybe we would like to know uh, what are other current trends in the field of research discovery and innovations, and maybe also the future pros prospects on the same. Over to you, Doc. Okay. So, yeah, apart from just drug. Um, uh, 
discovery, there's a lot of things that are happening. For example, uh, to detect an epidemic, yeah, one, uh, there's a lot of use of technology, for example. Uh, we've seen recently with the uh, SARS pandemic that immediately, immediately a new strain becomes available, technology platforms or technology has enabled yeah, scientists to uh, pick it up quickly. Yeah, that's one of them. And also there's a, a very, very, very um, uh, concerted efforts going on right now. For example, the use of uh, something called drones in uh, epidemiology. For example, you will send a drone to a particular area the foresight of a particular epidemic where there's an emerging uh, infection or an um, emerging disease, and it will send back data to you for you to analyze like in real time, okay? So it, it doesn't take too long uh, to take people to fiscally get into a particular place to be able to identify what is going on, okay? So it takes, it takes, uh, it takes uh, technology to be able to mount such kind of response, okay? Now, uh, what else? Uh, in AI, for example, uh, there's a field that is also uh, developing very well called metagenomics, for example. Instead of just testing what you know, what you know in a particular sample, uh, metagenomics uh, currently helps you identify several pathogens in one sample, okay? And quickly, yeah. So it, it will, uh, you go in a particular, for example, a uh, study that uh, I have interest in, you collect mosquitoes in Kenya, okay? And you bring them to the lab, you mash them, and you try to amplify anything, any virus that is in it. We know mosquitoes transmit chikungunya, maybe malaria, maybe other viruses like dengue virus, all that. So if you have primers, only primers for dengue, then you will think that it's only perhaps dengue which is in this, uh, which mos these mosquitoes can transmit. But if you use uh, metagenomic approaches, okay, which actually are based on uh, AI, yeah, or machine learning to classify things, you'll find that there are other uh, several pathogens that I have not just in mind, but the mosquitoes carry, yeah, things like that, okay? And so many, and so many in terms of uh, technology in public health, it's really, yeah. So here, uh, the CDC is now uh, putting up a very, very, very uh, great platforms, what we call advanced molecular diagnostics. Now they are not testing the culture anymore. They are not just trying to do PCR. They are now trying to even go further. Uh, they are upping up their game to the same that they are now going into uh, genomics or sequencing now at a public health level, not at a clinic level, they are doing that. For example, in districts, uh, I will give a district like in, in Kenya or something like that. They are doing advanced tests at the best at base level, you can imagine if uh, we get there in Africa, I think many lives will be saved. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. Uh, we have uh, another question from uh, yeah, Hilary Mambo asking, is there a requirement, any requirement for someone in statistics background to take up a PhD study in drug discovery? Yeah. Uh, the strengths of a statistics background uh, 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 graduate is that he has strong quantitative skills, okay? When it comes now to things to code in computers and all that in understanding any algorithms, it will be easier for him. But the challenge will be he needs to learn the biological chemistry now to understand the biological meaning of what he's doing because the end goal is not just to do things very fast or in, or in a particular way, but the idea, anything you are developing or anything you're working on, it's supposed to solve a biological or a health problem. 
So the challenge of a statistics person will be to be taught a lot of biology, yeah, to understand what he's doing in terms of uh, drug and to understand also chemistry, especially the biological chemistry. And therefore he'll be able to flourish in the field of uh, yeah, drug discovery or yeah, medicine or chemistry. Okay, thank you so much. We appreciate you, Doctor, for the for the and very nice uh, presentation. <clears throat> Sorry, and the yeah, and the question answers question for answering our question very well and very well elaborate. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. Uh, I'd like to uh, invite anyone else who has something to say. Yeah, maybe yeah. Before I hand over to Daniel, anyone else, please. Thank you so much, Professor Frederick Nindo, for the presentation. Yeah. I have something that I would ask. Please, in somewhere in your last, last slide, you talked about a protein that is called the CDK, something like that. Yeah. Um, excuse me, but I didn't go it properly. Okay. Could you please explain? Thank you. So what's the question about the CDK4? Yeah. I mean, in the presentation, you talked about a protein CDK that was maybe used for the treatment of melanoma or something like that. Yes, yes. I think yeah. I didn't got that slide properly. If it is possible to explain once more. Thank you so much. Okay, okay. So CDK4 and CDK6 are, um, I don't know if I'm still sharing, okay. Uh, CDK4 and CDK6 are molecules that are targeted by anti-cancer drugs, okay? Those are, they bear the receptors of, um, of drug attachment. When the drug enters the body, it attaches uh, those molecules. And therefore, uh, the idea is to simulate or to see uh, how the newly synthesized molecule that is attached to a known drug, okay, will help the drug bind better on this molecule, CDK molecule. And if it binds to it, then it's an inhibitor of certain cellular functions, and it will therefore go and kill the melanoma cells, okay? So that's the concept. So this is the 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 protein. Like this picture is the protein. Yeah. Which, is what protein. is what is the color? Like this green color. I mean, oh. how to see? Like you know. Okay. Okay. The green color is the change. When you see, um, this is basically a a three D structure of a protein. Okay. Yeah. When you see those branches, it's just like the backbone or the chains. In terms of the chemical formula, it could be the NH2, the amino groups and the carbon groups, all that. If you know uh, how an amino acid uh, protein is made, it's a chain of amino acids. So this is just them visualizing them in a, a graphical way in the computer. So <laughs> don't think that uh, this, this is uh, anything uh, scary or anything <laughs> created out of the blues, yeah. So this is just a visualization. In different colors means just different uh, uh, chains or groups, okay, in the structure. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Doc, for the, uh, answering our question very well. Now, I'd like to uh, hand over to Daniel uh, to say something before we end the session. Over to you, Daniel. Thank you, thank you, Jimmy. Thank you so much, Dr. Nindo, for the wonderful presentation. I hope you can hear me, sorry. Uh, I'm in a noisy place. Uh, no, no, I can hear you, no problem. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you so much for, for, for this wonderful session. It has been a pleasure, uh, uh, you know, listening to you and also you are a great inspiration to many of the, you know, many of us here. At least you have gone ahead and you have shown us that it's possible uh, for us to venture into, you know, this different drug research and discovery 
platforms and we really do appreciate uh, you uh, sacrificing your time. I know it's quite early uh, on your end. Oh, yeah, it's nice. Uh, yeah. It was 9 a.m. Yeah. yeah, so on yeah. Saturday, I had to wake up early. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we really do appreciate, you know, it's, it's not every day that someone gets up really early to, you know, just to uh, educate us. Uh, and we, we appreciate, and as Jimmy shared, uh, we, we are planning to have a, a fence program one that is you know, more planned and one that we can track. And we are trying to loop in different partners wherever we can, so that at least we're able to uh, engage some students in some, you know, not so much intensive, but trigger their interest to, to venture into this uh, field. And at the end of it, we're also trying to see whether we can also uh, uh, try to uh, want to help them to, you know, write their sc uh, scholarship applications and, you know, PhD, uh, programs and also the fellowships that can help them uh, penetrate the, the, this industry and sure. also uh, see if we can get different partners who can maybe offer a chance maybe for placement or uh, attachment or internship. So sure. we'll invite you once more uh, uh, once we start off in January and yeah, so we really do appreciate. Thank you so much. I think uh, we'll in the next session, you need to share with us uh, how you, how your story, you know, how you uh, came to doing sure. all this, because it's really inspiration. Maybe yeah. if you don't mind, uh, you can just just give us a tip, because I'm sure the the audience are really wondering how, how you've been able to accomplish all this. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, what we call tenacity, the idea of not uh, giving up in any situation. Okay. And also, um, you have to have the will, the will to uh, pursue a particular section. For example, it was uh, initially very challenging to come from a biological background and to understand computers. What I used to know on computers is to check email only. <laughs> That's what I knew. So when I went to my master's class the first day, we were given the terminal, yeah, that's Linux. And I thought I could uh, uh, erase like we do in Word. So I look like a, <laughs> like a very a lost, a lost person, okay? But with the time and with the right mentorship, yeah, you can make it, you can make it. I can assure you, yeah. So in the next sessions, uh, I know I'll, uh, be close to the leadership of South Africa, okay? And I'll be able to share my insights into, yeah, these things, yeah. And uh, yeah, show you maybe those who may be interested, uh, those who want to follow a particular, those who want to get into bioinformatics, it is still in demand worldwide. I think there's no bioinformatician who is jobless, yeah. Uh, you, move, you can move from one job to another. Yeah, uh, just to tell you, yeah. So if you get into bioinformatics, uh, the world is yours. Yeah, you can go place it, yeah. People are grappling with the big data nowadays, yeah. And therefore, it's, a, it's still a discipline that has a future, yeah, if I may say, yeah. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Nindo. Uh, we really do appreciate, thank you. I'm sure uh, some of our audience have heard and yeah, we hope that we'll have many, uh, many Dr. Nindos in the future, especially from Africa, so that also we can, you know, partake this cake of, uh, you know, drug research and at least we can bring some of this home to, you know, at least I think the COVID-19 situation has taught us that we also need to, to do something. Yeah. yeah, so thank you so much. Uh, and uh, for making the time and for uh, taking us through this session. Thank you so much for taking your time. And thank you to, to our audience for making it today. We really do appreciate. Uh, and I wish you a wonderful day ahead. And yeah. to our yeah. audience, I wish us a wonderful evening. Sorry so much for the noise. Uh, over to you, Jimmy, thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for the good, for the thanks uh, to our speaker today and also to the audience. Thank you so much. 
Uh, mine is just short. Uh, we have discussed a lot, and uh, surely you like to quote again what uh, Dr. Nindo has said. Actually, with guidance, with the uh, right mentorship, we can achieve. We can achieve a lot, and we can achieve greatness. Thank you so much, and we do believe that uh, you will be one of our main mentors and uh, uh, who will be guiding us into this research because actually. This is a group of uh, researchers uh, who are highly interested in uh, solving those problems that are facing Africa and also the entire globe at large. And we do believe that with your support and uh, support from uh, other willing uh, established professionals, we will be able to achieve a lot. Thank you so much once again for having time, creating time to do this nice presentation to us. And uh, we do believe that uh, we have learned a lot today. Actually, there's a lot of information that we have gained from the presentation. Uh, uh, and we do hope that uh, next time uh, we also having you back uh, for the uh, members uh, who the attendance. Uh, we do appreciate, we do appreciate for creating this time to attend this session and also learn from our speaker today. Thank you so much. And uh, with all that, I'd like to, of uh, to give back to Dr. Nindo to say something before we end the session. Over to you, Doctor. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity also to share um, an overview of what is going on in the field. And uh, yeah, the selection of the topic was uh, great. And uh, yeah, continue the same spirit to, yeah, knowledge is uh, valuable. And uh, if you seek it, you will get it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate that. And uh, with all that, I'd uh, like to end the session today. And uh, we meet in our uh, previous or we meet in our uh, sessions to come. Thank you so much and have a wonderful time all. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye bye, everyone. Keep warm, Dr. Nindo. Okay, I'll try. <laughs> okay. Yeah.